Hello, I'm Tony Perkins with Washington Watch. Each day, this program provides a biblical perspective on news, including insightful interviews with elected leaders, newsmakers, and cultural experts. I want to thank you for joining us today. We have a great program coming up, but first, here are some headlines from our friends with FISM News. For FISM News, I'm Samuel Case with your Washington Watch News update for Wednesday, March 20th. Well, the Afghanistan pullout continues to haunt President Biden as yesterday former Joint Chiefs of Staff Chair Mark Milley testified before Congress saying that against his own advice, the administration chose not to maintain a military president, uh, presence in the days leading up to the pullout. At the end of 20 years, we, the military, helped build an army, a state, but we could not forge a nation. The enemy occupied Kabul, the overthrow of the government occurred and the military we supported for two decades faded away. That is a strategic failure. But the military also provided hope for 20 years to the Afghan people. We provided unprecedented opportunity to millions. And in the final days, we gave 130,000 people their lives and freedom at very high cost. Milley told House lawmakers it was poor planning and timing that led to the deaths of the 13 U.S. troops in Kabul and created a power vacuum quickly filled by the Taliban. He said, quote, the fundamental mistake, fundamental flaw was the timing, saying, quote, I think it was too slow and too late. Meanwhile, a Texas immigration law is causing chaos in the courts, and FISM's Ian Patrick has the details. Texas continues to bear a large brunt of the current immigration crisis as it does everything to defend its borders. It enacted a new law in December which had allowed law enforcement to detain and deport illegal immigrants as part of an aid in this effort. But that law was quickly challenged by the Biden administration and has since bounced throughout the court system. Months of court battles have prevented the law from going into effect thanks to multiple stays. That came to a short-lived end on Tuesday with a refusal from the Supreme Court to take up the case and to weigh on its constitutionality specifically. Now, the Supreme Court's refusal meant that the law was allowed to go into effect while litigation continued in lower courts. Unfortunately for Texas, that was, as I said before, a short-lived victory. Hours later, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit announced that it would hear arguments on the case and subsequently, a panel voted to block it from taking effect while those arguments were considered. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke virtually to Senate Republicans today concerning Israel's fight against Hamas. The GOP's invitation comes as there's been growing tensions between President Biden and Netanyahu over Israel's current plans for a ground invasion in Rafah, something the prime minister addressed yesterday in a briefing to Israeli lawmakers. We have an argument with the Americans regarding the need to enter Rafah. Not regarding the need to eliminate Hamas, but rather the need to enter Rafah. We do not see a way to eliminate Hamas militarily without destroying those remaining battalions. We are determined to do so. This also comes only a week after Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer called for new elections in Israel to replace Netanyahu. And finally, 23 American citizens have safely fled Haiti, all thanks to Representative Corey Mills. The Florida Republican has now conducted two rescue missions so far, saying many Americans have been abandoned by the federal government. There is a pattern of abandonment by Biden and his administration that has existed since 2021 during the Afghan botched withdrawal. And, you know, as you know, I've unfortunately had to be involved in all three of these projects, you know, whether it was conducting uh, the very first successful overland rescue of Americans out of Afghanistan in 2021, uh, or even going against you Israel in 2023, where I was able to successfully get out 255 people. The State Department says nearly 1,000 Americans are asking for help in what the U.S. is calling one of the most dire humanitarian situations in the entire world. And with that, those are today's headlines from FISM News. Once again, I'm Samuel Case. And don't forget, as always, you can catch our full show tonight, 5 p.m. Eastern time on FISMnews.tv. We'll be covering these stories and so much more. All right, with all of that, now stay tuned for Washington Watch with Tony Perkins. And I'll see you again tomorrow with more news coverage. Catch you then.
From the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Well, good afternoon and welcome to Washington Watch. Broadcasting from the heart of our nation's capital, we bring you the latest insights, analysis, and interviews on the most pressing issues that are facing you and your family. So for the next hour, we're going to navigate the conflict and the complexities of our nation's capital with clarity, integrity, and a relentless pursuit of truth. Washington Watch starts now. Let's get one thing straight. The violence and this humanitarian crisis rests entirely on the shoulders of Hamas. This entire conflict would end if the cowardly terrorists who rule Gaza from beneath schools and hospitals released their innocent hostages. That was the current Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell earlier today. Well, some of President Biden's top donors urged the president to distance himself from Israel. Republicans on Capitol Hill are providing support for our strategic ally. House Speaker Mike Johnson has been discussing an invitation to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to address a joint session of Congress, as he did back in 2015 when Barack Obama was president. Well, today, Senate Republicans had a virtual conversation with the Israeli leader. Oklahoma Senator James Langford joins us with details of that meeting in just a moment. The American people deserve to hear the truth. Though the truth involving the deep corruption of the Biden family, including the malfeasance of the sitting president of the United States, might be raw and unpleasant, the American people must hear it. That was Biden family business partner Tony Bobolinsky earlier at today's oversight and accountability hearing on influence peddling, examining Joe Biden's abuse of public office. We'll talk about that later. And a rash of airline safety incidents has many pointing to the FAA's and the airline industry's focus on DEI rather than S-A-F-E-T-Y, safety. About three dozen members of Congress are trying to get ahead of the DEI curve as it pertains to health care by introducing legislation to stop the spread of diversity, equity, and inclusion virus in America's medical schools. The author of that bill, Dr. Greg Murphy of North Carolina, will join me later. And the situation in Haiti continues to deteriorate. As of March 20th, the U.S. government is facilitating the safe departure of U.S. citizens from Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, organizing government chartered helicopter uh, flights uh, from Port-au-Prince to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. That was State Department Principal Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel. We'll explore the history of this situation in Haiti and why, why we should be concerned about this country, which is just about 700 miles from our shores with Professor A.J. Nolte later on today's edition of Washington Watch. As always, as we dive into today's issues, remember the bedrock principles that guide us here at Washington Watch, faith, family, and freedom. And these are not just words, but values that form the very foundation of our nation's greatness. Well, for decades, support of Israel has been a bipartisan issue, but that is changing, and it is changing fast, as the Democratic Party is being steered by its progressive base that appears to pick Hamas over Israel. Well, earlier this afternoon, Senate Republicans heard from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu during a virtual meeting in which they were given an update on Israel's war against Hamas. What did the prime minister share with the senators? Well, joining me now to discuss this, Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. He serves on four Senate committees, including the Senate Homeland Security Committee and the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Senator Lankford, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to see you. Tony, always great to see you. You know, we took one of the first uh, congressional tours over into what's called the West Bank in Samaria, Judea, um, probably about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. We were on that, uh, that tour. Um, things have changed a lot. It used to be a bipartisan issue, not so much anymore. Yeah, it's painful. I, I think about when I first came into Congress, I used to tell people there weren't many bipartisan issues, but Israel was one of them. And now suddenly this has become very partisan in many ways. And it, I guess it really hasn't been suddenly. It's been transitioning over several years. But I'm hearing more and more rhetoric that is more pro-Palestinian than it is pro-Israel, forgetting that Israel was the one who was ruthlessly attacked in, uh, attacked in a terrorist attack. They weren't trying to provoke anything. They were just trying to exist. What uh, can you share with us about your conversation with the prime minister today? 
Yeah, we had about a 45 minute dialogue with him. Uh, he walked through some of the military operations, what's happening, what's happening in their government and the structure, how they're holding up, quite frankly, under the stress of being under a war suddenly since October the 7th of last year. He did talk about some of the conversation about Rafa and about Hamas, uh, because there is this whole push currently from the administration to say, don't go into Rafa and take out Hamas there. There are multiple units that are organized terrorist groups that are hiding out in Rafa. And the uh, prime minister was very clear to be able to say this would be like World War II to say, take out the Nazis, except don't go to Berlin. Leave Berlin alone. You can't actually go into that area and take out those Nazis. His challenge is I've got Hamas as a organized terrorist organization that they have repetitively, even recently said, when this is over, we're going to go back and do another October the 7th. We will do it as many times as we possibly can. He can't do that without actually going into where they're hiding under civilians. So they've also been very clear they're doing everything they can to protect the lives of civilians. And when you often hear the numbers from Hamas saying that there were 30,000 people that have died in this, they conveniently leave out that about 14 or 15,000 of those are Hamas fighters. Uh, so that ends up with a one to one ratio while every single life is valuable. Every life is valuable. Israel is being very aggressive to be able to do what they can to be able to protect the lives of civilians. But this is a war that Hamas started, and they continue to hide hostages and their fighters among civilians. Yeah, when I, I was in Israel last week and met with the prime minister, and he shared uh, actually using the same illustration, uh, he also said that, look, we can't fight to a draw. We have to win. Right. Uh, we, we, right. we can't just come to a truce and say, hey, let's, let's go about our business, because as you just pointed out, he's made very clear Hamas will be back. Yeah, they will. They have threatened to be back, and they mean to do it. So th this is not just an idle threat for them. Their intention is to be able to come back and not only kill more Israelis, uh, civilians, but they intend to build more rockets and just shoot them at Tel Aviv and everywhere they can haphazardly. D did he also express the concern, not only do we have Hamas, which is, quite frankly, not the greatest of the threats. You have Hezbollah and in right. even, um, you, you know, Iran, who it's the puppet master, but they could step up their actions against Israel uh, to a greater level. Yeah, he talked about the uh, the three H's that are out there, Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis that are in Yemen. And people lose track of the fact that in Yemen, the Houthis right now are still launching rockets at Israel. Some of them have actually impacted in Israel all the way from Yemen, that they're launching rockets towards civilians there. Hezbollah continues to be able to shoot rockets into northern Israel, where you've got 100,000 Israelis who have had to flee from their homes in northern Israel because Hezbollah continues to be able to threaten them and to be able to launch rockets at them. So while they talk about the people displaced in Gaza, and that's all, all human life is valuable, and that's tragic for their, what's happening in that war that Hamas started there, people just conveniently leave out 100,000 people in northern Israel that are also having to live as refugees away from their homes because of Hezbollah attacks. So why only the demands of Israel to lay down their weapons to, to pursue a truce when they were not the aggressors in this war, as you pointed out, and he shared this with us, surgically trying to take out Hamas, being very careful to avoid civilian casualties. But uh, we're, they're not letting, uh, I say they, uh, they're not letting the refugees. Egypt will not let them go. Uh, into the, across the border into their country. I would think, Senator Langford, that with the strong ties we have with Egypt, given the amount of foreign aid we give them, we could lean on them if we wanted to, to allow passage through that country. Well, I would say the Egyptians have been very, very clear that they don't want Hamas in their country either. They don't want the Palestinian refugees in their country either. They have a fence on their border with Gaza, just like Israel has a fence on their border with Gaza to be able to make sure those individuals are not flooding over the border into Egypt. So while everyone seems to attack Israel in this process and to say that they're isolating uh, these Palestinians in Gaza, the Egyptians are in the same boat to say, we don't want that here. And even what we've seen from um, the, the leader of the Senate, uh, for him to be able to step out and to be able to say that as leader Schumer, I should be clear, for him to step out and call for elections in a transition of Netanyahu, he's not called for new change in leadership in Hamas or change in leadership in Hezbollah or change in right. leadership in Venezuela or in Iran. It's a change in leadership in Israel. And we need to be very clear that Israel has elected the leader of Netanyahu and he is leading in the time of war. And we need to stand with our ally during a time of war. 
Absolutely, 100 percent. Senator, I know you got to go. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, always great to, uh, to catch up with you. It's good to see you again, Tony. Thanks for holding this up. All right. Senator James Langford of uh, Oklahoma. You know, I was talking with someone about this the other day. What if Republicans came out because the Democrats are wanting, you know, more funding for uh, Ukraine and said, you know what, we have questions about the leadership of Ukraine. Uh, and therefore, we think the Ukrainian people should have an election and replaced Zelensky as the, the president. Well, I mean, they would go crazy. Oh, you're undermining the country in the middle of a war. Well, that's exactly what Chuck Schumer did to the Israelis by calling for them to dissolve their government and have elections. I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but this is important. I, I've shared this before. In fact, I shared it with the prime minister when I met with him last week. I believe America's future is intertwined with that of Israel. You say, what do you mean? Not only are they a strategic ally for us, in fact, they provide great stability in the Middle East. They are a stabilizing force, and they do a lot of work in keeping the Middle East stabilized. But beyond that, beyond being a strategic military political ally, they are spiritually very significant to us as a nation. And I speak as a Bible-believing Christian here, where the Scripture says in Genesis chapter 12, those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed. Now, you say, well, you know, that's, that's Old Testament Scripture. Well, it's also history. Look at those countries that have pursued this very small percentage of the population, about 0.05 percent of the population. But yet they seem to be in the crosshairs of so many people, so many nations. I think every generation has to answer the question as to how they will treat the Jewish people, whether they'll be silent at their persecution or participate in the persecution. Neither one turns out well. I believe our future is intertwined with that of Israel, because as a nation, America for the last 60 years has really been walking away, has steadily walked away from the word and the ways of God. And last week, I was standing on the Mount of Blessing in Israel and Samaria, areas that the United States, the Biden administration, wants to give away in the two-state solution. And you know, the blessing came when we walk in the ways of God according to the word of God. We're not doing that in America. We're not. But I believe that God has preserved this nation because we have stood with Israel. We have been really a, a protector, a provider. We've helped Israel. And God has blessed us, I believe, because of that. When we walk away from that, America's future does not look promising. And so I believe it is extremely important that we are praying for and standing with Israel. Doesn't mean we agree with everything that they do. It doesn't mean that we can't encourage them to do it better. But we need to stand with them and not turn our back and walk away from them. And I want to encourage you and join me in praying for Israel. Last week I was there praying in different parts of the country. We're going to continue that effort. If you'd like to join us in standing with Israel, text Israel to 67742. That's Israel to 67742. Okay, after the break, is DEI a prescription for bad health care? We're going to talk with Congressman Greg Murphy after the break. So don't go away. More Washington Watch straight ahead on this Wednesday afternoon. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign. Righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice. 
When the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now, now. Let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. to Washington Watch. The website is TonyPerkins.com. All right, a recent rash of airline safety incidents has many pointing to the FAA and the airline industry's obsession with DEI rather than safety as a major contributing factor. Well, about three dozen members of Congress are trying to get ahead of the downward DEI curve as it pertains to health care by Introducing legislation to stop the spread of the DEI virus in America's medical schools. Join me now to discuss this and more. Congressman Greg Murphy, author of the bill. Dr. Murphy serves on three House committees, including the Ways and Means Committee, which uh, uh, is overseeing a lot of activity right now in Congress. He's been in uh, several hearings today, and I appreciate him uh, stepping out to, uh, to talk with us. He represents the 3rd Congressional District of North Carolina. Dr. Murphy, welcome back to Washington Watch. Hey, Tony, hope you're doing well. Thanks for you for having me. Absolutely. So let's talk about uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and your concerns about how that is infecting America's medical schools. Yeah, you know, Tony, I think diversity can be a very strengthening thing. People learn from one another of experiences that perhaps they don't have. But the thing that we can't do in medical schools is lower our standards of, of merit, lower our standards of excellence. Why? Um, you know, as I said yesterday, this is not art school. This is not English school, not history school. This is medical school. This is where people's lives are at risk. The, uh, I think really the relationship that's strongest is the maternal bond, but uh, physician-patient is right up there and the trust and uh, and the abidement in both of those uh, both of those relationships, and the fact now that our medical schools are uh, making our their students sign DEI pledges, and they're pushing out activists, not advocates, um, is very very troubling. And we're seeing this already in the decrease in quality of some of our uh, students. And the fact that they're burned out five years after their residency rather than, you know, 25 years. And uh, I think it's time to put a shot across the bow. This cannot happen. We cannot be taken over in, an object, in a world of objective science by liberal arts uh, progressive ideas. I mean, it, it has real-life consequences, and they can be deadly. Mm -hmm. So let, let's talk today uh, about today's Ways and Means Committee hearing with uh, Secretary uh, Javier Becerra as— um, Ways and Means Committee Chair 
Uh, J Jason Smith noted in his opening statement today, and I quote, words like diversity, discrimination, racial justice, and gender all appear in the administration's budget far more than the border. Fentanyl, the number one killer of Americans ages 18 to 45, is only mentioned once in a footnote. Yeah. Your thoughts? Equity was mentioned 77 times, and fentanyl was mentioned once. Um, this is the whole, you know, I, I actually said this just a few minutes ago to Secretary Becerra, is this, it's the tone deafness of this administration, absolute tone deaf. They've opened up our border to be invaded, you know, in North Carolina, up in Gates County, two weeks ago, an illegal immigrant was shooting people and he was found to be a terrorist uh, on the watch uh, on the watch on the terrorist watch list. Found with guns. He was found the Quran. He was found with Arabic uh, military information. And you know what? What are they doing? They are absolutely contributing to the downfall, the spiraling uh, of this great nation. And you know, Basera just uh, you know smiles with his arrogant smile, and uh, it's just tone deafness, uh, Tony. It's absolutely tone deaf to the problems that face this nation. You know, Dr. Murphy, I have to ask this question because I know this is what's on a lot of people's minds. I hear it all the time. Why? Well, how can they be so blind to the to the impact that the policies that they're pushing have upon this nation? Is it intentional or are they that I, I, I don't want to say uh, well, they, they got to see it. They, they cannot ignore the consequences. I'll say incompetent. I'll say it, Tony. I'll say it. They're incompetent. And the other thing is, um, you know, I'm not one, it, maybe it's my surgical attitude. I demand competence. I demand excellence. Yeah. Uh, patience. Well, should, if you were my doctor, I would that. want that. That's what I want out of my doctor. That's what I want out. Actually, yeah, that's what I want out of every place I go. I want, I want the best. I, and if I want the opportunity to have the best. I, I don't want to lecture well, on, you know, the various aspects of society, which is what's happening in our medical schools today. Well, it's uh, we've we're we're lowering the bar of excellence. You know, look, I, I want a diverse class, but I'm not willing for us to sacrifice what the merit bar is um, to but, just ba basically have a nice, better pie puzzle. But can't we have um, both? I think those can't we have both? Yeah, we can have both. We can have both. But um, absolutely, I think it would be great to have both. But we can't let people. I remember. Uh, I won't give anecdotes, but. You know, gosh, you know, think if you're going to have heart surgery the next day, somebody's going to be splitting your chest open, your life is in their hands. Who do you want doing that? Who do you want doing that? Do you want somebody who may be mean, but he's the best in the world? Or did you do you want somebody who got in because of identity politics? Yeah, I, I want the best. Want I patient? want the best. You know, and, you know, it, I, um, I just uh, I don't understand it. And, you know, we go back to the border. Tony, the only thing I can think of. The only thing I can think of is they uh, they want to overrun some states. Illegals now are counted in the uh, numbers for members of Congress and representative numbers to overrun states to flood them up to get more Democratic members of Congress. I just, yeah. you know, I didn't. And you know, certain states want their illegal folks to vote in elections. Yeah. My God, what are we becoming as a country? You know, I, I want to go back very quickly, uh, Congressman, before we run out of time. A, a biblical parallel to what you're talking about, professionalism, having the best. You know, Jethro's father, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, when he went to him to talk about the leaders, he said, able men who fear God. And, and that's even what I look for in elected leaders. I want Christians, but I want able Christians. I want men and women who know what they're doing. Character matters, but so does competence. Absolutely. And, you know, he, it, Tony, if we let folks in just merely because of the amount of melanin in their skin or what their identity politics is, it pollutes those who have the same, you know, whatever skin color or identity politics they have who are excellent. Right. And we're lowering the bar. And, you know, Ben Carson, we've had several, oh, I've had several discussions with him about great this. Great guy. He absolutely agrees. Yeah. Absolutely agrees. It, we can have both. We can have the diversity we and we can have excellence. I appreciate you pursuing that and uh, keeping those issues at the forefront, even at great political risk, because some will take and distort it. Congressman Murphy, no Murphy, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to talk with you. All right. Thank you so much. God bless. You know, it's so true. I mean, in everything, we should pursue able-bodied, competent individuals. And, and all the other stuff is, is important, character, all that's greatly 
important. It's tremendously important. But they got to know what they're doing. All right, don't go away. More Washington Watch on the other side of the break. Thank you again for these dear friends and those who serve, who you've called here to serve. We've heard their hearts this morning, God. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you give us all wisdom, discernment, stamina to do the things that you have called us to do. And as Solomon asked, and as we repeat, Lord, that you would give us the courage to walk in your ways, to follow your commands, and to stand for truth so that we can govern and administer justice in a way that is pleasing and honorable to you. We ask and pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. Amen. above all names by which we must be saved, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the only answer, the only hope America has that it might yet again shine as a city on a hill. No revival comes without repentance. So God, we pray that we would own our own sin. God, that we'd walk before you in constant revival. What have we done to our children? We are teaching them that there is no God and that they can define good and evil. Lord, have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would commission us to go and make your word known and your truth to a world that is in desperate need of that truth and that hope. Lord, I pray that we would answer the call and say, here we are. Send us in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back to Washington. Watch the website, TonyPerkins.com. Good to have you with us on this uh, Wednesday. Well, last night was the biggest primary night since Super Tuesday with voters heading to the polls in Arizona, Florida. Uh, Florida was the GOP only. Uh, Illinois, Kansas, and Ohio. Now, um, while the results of the presidential primaries were as expected, there were other key races worth noting, including the lead up to what could perhaps be the most consequential race in the battle for the Senate this November. And here to share the details on that is Matt Carpenter, director of FRC Action. Matt, welcome uh, to uh, Washington Watch. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right, so before we get into the results of last night's poll, I mean last night's uh, elections results, uh, FRC action been up on the hill the last two days, delivering right. thousands of petitions that listeners have uh, been signing. That's right. Tell us about it. Yeah, we've, we've been busy this week with delivering petitions to the hill. Yesterday, we delivered uh, 43,000 signatures to Speaker Mike Johnson, just encouraging the work uh, that they're doing to secure the border, asking them to use all available leverage, everything in, in their power to just give the American people some relief from this just torrent of humanity crossing our southern border. We understand the Biden administration is now flying them into this country, and, and we're just asking, hey, let's, let's use every available means we can to secure the border. And today we delivered 20,000 signatures to uh, Representative Chris Smith, encouraging his excellent worth, uh, work to uh, prevent more funding to UNRWA. Uh, yeah. which has been involved in the October 7th attack on Israel. And, uh, you know, we actually, when we were in Israel, we were praying over actually at the Nova Musical Festival site, praying and, and, and really binding this financial dollars coming from the United States to UNRWA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, reports are the bill's not out yet, but it does look like they're going to be defunded in this appropriations bill. Yeah, it does seem like there's some, there's some bipartisan consensus there to at least suspend funding temporarily, but uh, yeah, we're trying it's temporary. to trying to end that funding altogether. Well, and we did under the under the Trump administration and hopefully under the next administration we'll do uh, the, the same. But thanks for delivering those. So folks, if you signed those border petitions or you signed the petition on UNRWA, that was delivered this week. And um, of course, we will continue to let your voice be heard on Capitol Hill. So when we put those out there, 
please be sure and sign them. All right, so what can you tell us about yesterday's uh, election results? Yeah, well, as you point out in your opening remarks, Tony, on the presidential side, there were a lot of contests, not much to report there. Um, they pretty much went as expected. Biden won on the Democratic side and, and Trump won on the, on the Republican side. But uh, all eyes were really on Ohio. There was a, an important uh, race on the Republican side to see who was going to face off against Democrat incumbent Sherrod Brown in the Senate race there. So of the 34 Senate seats up for reelection this cycle, 21 are defended by Democrats. And you've got this razor thin margin in the Senate where 51 Democrats against 49 Republicans. So you know, you've got states like Ohio and West Virginia, Arizona, Montana with, with Democrat uh, incumbents or Democrats who previously held it. So uh, Ohio could be a pickup opportunity to decide who controls the Senate come 2025. I mean, it looks pretty promising for the Republicans going into this election in terms of picking up the Senate. Absolutely. Yeah, there's it's a target rich environment if you're on the Republican Senate uh, you know, campaign arm. You got Arizona, there's a competitive race. I, I, we just mentioned Ohio, but also Wisconsin and Michigan, too, and, and Pennsylvania, and, and maybe even Virginia. You never yeah. know. So um, what do our listeners and our viewers need to be aware of? What's coming up next? What resources mm -hmm. do we have available for them that can help those that still need to uh, to vote? Right. So there's, there's a lot of presidential primaries between now and uh, and the conventions, the rest of this month is going to be relatively quiet, but um, the next uh, primaries I've got my eye on is, is Pennsylvania. Uh, April 23rd, they've got some important um, House and, and a Senate primary as well to figure out who's going to challenge Bob Casey for that seat. Uh, and then next is Indiana, where you've got the congressional primaries as well, a Senate primary, and then also governor too. So India is one of those states that's going to choose a new governor in 2024. So um, those are some states to keep to be for your, your viewers to be aware of. And I would direct them to visit frcaction.org. We've got excellent resources we've, uh, on how to register to vote. Uh, we've got our scorecard there, our party platform comparison documents, and also voter guides that are available. So there's a link there to go to the iVoter guides that, uh, for each of those states that are coming up. Correct. You just put your zip code in, and a customized voter guide will be available for you. Wow, that's great. Uh, very handy. So go to frcaction.org. And, and the other resources there, Matt, on uh, FRC Action, in terms of the party platform. Now, this is the old party platform because the the parties will not craft their new platforms until this summer when the right. conventions meet. But it's a good place to start in showing the contrast between the two parties. Excellent. That's that's an excellent point, Tony. And you know, all the members who have who are currently there, you know, data shows about 80 percent of the members vote with their party. So it does give you a sense of of uh, of how the parties have been moving and which direction they've been going and. Definitely want to encourage people to pay attention to the conventions and what the, par the party platforms look like coming out of the conventions. And, and start having those conversations with friends now because, you know, people say, oh, I just don't know. I just the, the personalities of these people running. It's not about the personalities. Focus on the policies That's that right. they're promoting because we, as you pointed out, 75 to 80 percent of the time the parties follow those platforms. And, and what the what Joe Biden is doing right now, the Democratic Party is actually in their platform. That's that's right. That's right. He's not deviated far from from the, st the Democratic Party standard. And, you know, it's it's something that, that people can share. They can get a link from our from our website and share that with friends and family. All right, Matt Carpenter, thanks so much for joining us. And thanks for delivering those p petitions to Capitol Hill today. My pleasure, Tony. Thanks for having me. All right. And, and folks, again, that's uh, that's why we do the these petitions. We deliver them. We take them up to Capitol Hill. We give them to the members of Congress so that they We'll hear from you. So we're your hands and feet here in our nation's capital. We help amplify your voice. So please be a participant. Don't just be a spectator. All right. By the way, we need to be praying for Israel. I talked about that earlier. It's another action item for you. Text Israel to 67742. All right. After the break, I'm going to be joined by Regent University Associate Professor Dr. A.J. Nolte to talk about what's unfolding in Haiti. You don't want to miss that conversation. We're coming back after this. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of Family Research Council. Sometimes the headlines are overwhelming and it feels like we're alone and there's nothing we can do. That is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. Reading through the Bible, there are many things that are counterintuitive. One of them is that God never uses a majority. It is always a minority devoted to the truth. 
Here at Family Research Council, we're grateful to stand side by side with other believers for the truth, and as a result, God is making a difference. When you partner with us, you're joining with Christians around the nation and standing together for the truth of God's Word supplying pastors and parents and school boards with training and resources to stand up against the indoctrination of your children. I invite you to become a STAND member and stand with FRC today. Together, with God's help, we can preserve freedom for the next generation. Go to frc.org and become a STAND member today. Again, that's frc.org. Stand with us. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sage con, to learn more. I'm Tony Perkins, and I have a prediction. This year, there will be uncertainty and continued political and cultural division. Okay, so that's not that startling of a prediction. But try this. We can have peace and even joy amid the chaos. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus told us there would be days like this so that our eyes would be upon him and his promises rather than our circumstances. Now, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Abide in Him by being in His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. With just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But most importantly, you'll be abiding in Him daily, living in His joy and peace in these trying times. Join me on this journey through the Bible. Go to frc.org Bible for more. I'm Tony Perkins, and this is Washington Watch. Thanks for tuning in on this uh, Wednesday. By the way, we're calling on, on all men to awaken to the truth that God's Word has given them a directive to provide leadership in their home, in their church, in their community. And we're bringing that call to the men of the greater New York and New Jersey metro areas through a Stand Courageous Men's Conference this coming Saturday. That's right, this Saturday. This will be a day of hope, awakening, and healing for men seeking to be all that God has created them to be. To be. Now, we're grateful that Liquid Church in Parsippany, uh, New Jersey, will be hosting this conference. And you can join us. There's still room. It's almost full. It's exciting. Men are coming from all over. Uh, but you can still join us. Go to StandCourageous.com to find out more. That's StandCourageous.com to find out more, but do it quickly. Our word for today comes from Numbers chapter 20. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Now this is not the first time they encountered a lack of water. They had been there before, and God had provided so did they turn to God in faith like David when he faced Goliath, recounting how God had delivered him before? No, they complained. Now, keep in mind, this was a new generation, but it was the old, same old song and dance. Why did you bring us here to die? You know, Egypt was so much better. Well, their bodies were freed from slavery, but their minds and souls were not. Many people are physically in the church, the body of Christ, but mentally and spiritually, they're still in the world, living in captivity. The mentality of bondage is stronger than the iron of the chains. To find out more about our journey through the Bible, go to frc.org slash Bible. Or if you'd like to join me each day for this journey through the Bible, text Bible to 67742. That's the word Bible to 67742. It's a text that'll change your life. The Caribbean country of Haiti has been plagued by chaos and bloodshed since its founding. 
with episodes of major violence flaring up from time to time. Well, the latest chaos that has been simmering over the past year erupted in recent weeks, plunging Haiti further, further into an increasingly serious humanitarian, political, and security crisis. What's behind this? It's important to know what's behind it in order to find out what the solutions might be. Join me now to discuss this, Dr. A.J. Nolte, an associate professor at Regent University. Much of Dr. Nolte's Ph.D. dissertation research looked into faith and politics in relation to state formation. Dr. Nolte, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to have you with us. Great to be back, Tony. Thanks so much. So before we get into what's currently happening, let's step back here because, you know, Haiti has, I mean, it, it just has a record of turbulence and uh, difficulties. Give us a little bit of historical background on Haiti. So Haiti is, uh, becomes independent of France in uh, 1804. Um, very famously, there's a, a slave revolution. Um, it was one of those Caribbean um, slave colonies where slavery was particularly brutal and pervasive institution. Um, and so there was a there was a revolution, and it's the chaos of of uh, revolutionary France. Haiti becomes independent um, in that time period, and um, really has has kind of since then. Uh, there have been periods of stability, but there's been, as is often the case in Central and South America, there's been a lot of instability, um, chaos, um, class conflict. Um, to, to a certain extent, some of the conflict has been racial in, in the past between different, um, you know, uh, variations. Uh, race and class are sometimes closely linked in Haiti. Um, and so what, you, what you've seen is, you know, sort of brief, brief periods of stability. Um, longer periods of instability. Um, and in recent years, probably within the past, um, well, since since the 1980s, uh, kind of uh, state failure. Um, and state failure in particular that followed on from the uh, di the Duvalier dictatorships, father and son who were who were dictators. Um, and I wanna, I'll, I'll come back come back to that in a second when we start looking at how, how we got there. But um, you had a pattern of dictatorship followed by chaos and instability, um, and then a spiral that has led to what I think would be, and some people say this is controversial, but I think it's fair to say uh, we are now in state failure in, in Haiti. Let's go back to Papa Doc and Baby Doc in particular, because the United States has a history in, in Haiti. Yeah. I mean, well, it's not, our hands are not clean when it comes to, right. to, to Haiti. Let's talk about that. So the United States has a long history of intervening in Caribbean countries, sometimes to provide, quote unquote, stability and security, sometimes um, to kind of look out for its own interests in terms of, of extraction. Um, and the U.S., particularly during the Cold War, had a history of supporting dictatorships that were often quite brutal uh, in Caribbean countries. And so many people looking at Haiti will say, well, you know, the U.S. is, is really, uh, in whole or in part, responsible for a lot of the problems in Haiti. Um, and I think you, the problems in Haiti, there's so many different causal factors that are, that are causing the situation in Haiti. Um, so the U.S. intervention is probably one of them. But I will say this. I think it has been somewhat, in, in a lot of the popular media, has been somewhat exaggerated. Um, and let me give you a little bit of context as to why I say that. When in comparative politics, which is my subdiscipline of what we study, we like to look at countries that have a lot of things the same, so we can try to isolate what's different. And Haiti, of course, Tony, as you know, shares a, a the island of Hispaniola with the Dominican Republic. Now, what's interesting about this comparison is that from 19, in 1960, these two countries had basically the same per capita GDP. Now, Dominican Republic's GDP is about five times that of Haiti, according to the World Bank. Um, and what's interesting is even in that time, both of those countries had dictatorships. Both those countries had U.S. interventions. Both those countries were sort of U.S. allies against the Soviet Union, and the U.S. was supporting them. Um, and yet, there's a very different outcome. And so what we we try to do in a situation like that is say, okay, look at these two countries. Is there is there a variable that we can isolate that is different? Um, and I will, I will say this, just to be honest with you and your listeners, with Haiti and the Dominican Republic, that's actually a very challenging thing to do. Is there, when you look back at the history, as you said, it became a, 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 a country as a result of the slave revolt, 
seeking their yeah. freedom. They've, they've, poverty has long been a problem there. But as you look at the, you know, in your expertise of the role of faith in nation formation, is there any faith foundation in Haiti? I mean, there's a lot of the, 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 the cult, cultic activity there. Yeah. Is that a contributing factor to the instability that we see in the chaos? So I want to say probably yes. I want to give a slight caveat to that. And the caveat is it's really hard to get good numbers on things like how many people are voodoo practitioners in, in Haiti, because different studies and different things that you go will claim different numbers. And there's a reason for that. And that is because in Haiti, as you see in, in other parts of the Caribbean, to some extent, Christianity and these um, practices that are you know, largely drawn out, drawn out of West African and, and uh, indigenous Caribbean spirituality are kind of mixed in with Christianity. So it's right. all sort of um, mixed, mixed together in what we call syncretism. Right. But there are a couple of things that I look at when I look at religion. So generally speaking, religion will actually be a positive for development for, for societies. It increases social trust, so trust between members of the same uh, society, and it increases, increases social capital because religion and religious organizations, they tend to do a lot of stuff. They combat poverty. Um, they help bring people together. Um, Christianity in particular tends to be really good for things like literacy. Um, Christian, because Christians are teaching people, obviously, to read the Bible. It's very important. Um, however, what you can see sometimes with um, different types of paganism and, and some of those those elements that were syncretized with Roman Catholicism in, in Haiti have this, is that actually the relationship with the gods is more like, um, you know, a, a, a more equivalent of a mafia relationship where it's, it's patron-client. It's not like a personal relationship based on, um, you know, mutual love and, and, you know, even, in fact, having certain... Uh, rights as bears as the image of, image of God. It's it's very much about extracting power um, and having you know sort of being almost being in a patron client relationship where um, the pagan gods operate as sort of mob bosses. Um, why might this be problematic? Well, partially because um, it sets up an institutional framework where it normalizes that as sort of to say this is the way society is organized. Because as people believe about transcendent realities, that's going to impact the way they think. You know the world works, um, and so unfortunately, I think that could be leading to some of the lack of social trust for those outside of the immediate circle that we see in Haiti. And low social trust is definitely something that is inhibiting economic growth and economic development. Also, with the absence of that, I mean, it, it factors into the rule of law. I mean, yes, it, because you know the one thing about especially Christianity, which is the area that I've focused on. It, the, the foundation of all forms of government, whether it's family government, whether it's church government or it's civil government, is self-government. And, yes. and you, you really, that, that seems to have been all but lost in Haiti. Yes. Well, and, and you're right in, in saying that the rule of law is directly related to a lot of these religious ideas. Um, and particularly, I would say Christian ideas play a very impor important role there. So, for example... Take the issue of corruption. Um, we as Americans tend to think of corruption as unnatural. But actually, if we look at the Bible, corruption is a natural. It's a consequence of the fall. It, it comes in from sin. And it's it's part of human nature. And we actually have to work really, really hard to build a society where that's not just seen as the way things are done. Um, and but that, part that's, of the reason that's kind of been, the that's kind of the role of the church in keeping absolutely. lawlessness in check. I mean, the New Testament yes. even talks about that. Yes, and, abs and, that's, and that's borne out by social scientific data. Strong churches and strong uh, high levels of religiosity, particularly Christianity, tend to, to correlate with low level levels of corruption. Now, if you look at just pure demographics, you look at Haiti and say it's majority Christian, but a lot of that Christianity, there, there are these other syncretic elements that are, that are there. And so that might be impeding the norm. Normally, we would see Christianity help with rule of law, and, and we're not seeing that. But that is not, as you pointed out, not isolated to Haiti. We see a lot of that right. in Central and South America. So I want to go back yes. to your comparative analysis with the Dominican Republic. Can you identify any variable variables that are different that might contribute to the, to the reason the Dominican Republic is prospering? Probably the best variable is 
the Dominican Republic, even when it was under dictatorship, there was a the, the dictatorship. And this is not to say that the dictatorship of Rafael Trujillo wasn't nasty and terrible. And we would obviously prefer to be under democracy. But Trujillo did try to modernize the country and try to kind of build things toward free markets. Um, from what I can tell, and I'm not an expert on the history of, of Haiti as much as I am in, in some other areas, but from what I can tell, basically the father and son Duvalier just stole everything that wasn't nailed down. Right. Um, and there was there was no attempt at any kind of development or anything um, for the country. And so what happened when they fell was anarchy. It's very similar in trajectory to Somalia, where you had a very brutal, corrupt dictatorship. It falls, and then immediately you have a humanitarian crisis. So are we looking at the same situation in Haiti as we see in Somalia, where war, the, the strongest warlord uh, gang leader comes forth and, and provides some kind of tyrannical um, you know, government in terms of not really government, but just kind of keeping everybody in check because they have the strongest power? Unfortunately, that's that's one of the possible outcomes. Um, every, I mean, the United States has intervened in the past and it hasn't been able to sustain it. Um, and that's that's one of the problems is that if you're going to, to have a successful solution in Haiti, you have to have locals on the ground who have enough capacity to basically, you know, beat the gangs in a fight if they need to, right? So the military and the police have what we call in political science terms the monopoly of force, and also have enough trust of the from the people um, that they can they can govern the country effectively. That's a very long term project, and that's not a project that the United States that U.S. intervention is if if we're going to do that as a band aid at best, and the solution is going to have to come from local folks. And I would also say it's going to have to come from a serious, sustained engagement of faithful Christians. The good news from that perspective is that Christians have a history of being involved in countries like that, being the first responders, being at the tip of the spear. And actually, as in a paper that I, I co-wrote with um, Ariel Del Turco, who's there at, at FRC, um, if you want to force multiplier for international development, uh, faith-based organizations are the key to that. And so it's going to have to be primarily local driven. And then the outside actors that, that are going to have to be the most involved are faith based. But before they can come in, of course, you need security. Yeah. So where does that security come from? Security, I think, is going to have to come from um, the U.S. and other actors um, helping to stand up um, local you know, stand up and, tra and train local forces. Um, and that's that's a long term project. Yeah. In other words, y you might have temporary security provided by internationals, but you need to transition as quickly as you can to trusted local forces. Right. Because without that, you cannot begin to to do the rebuilding uh, that yes. is required, and especially having the faith community come in and, and build those relationships in the in the infrastructure that's going to be necessary. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nolte, great to see you. Thanks so much for good to, uh, joining good to us see you today. As well. All right. Absolutely. Have a great day. Well, another thing to be praying about. Um, you know, you know, if you think about it, though, this this again goes back to elections. I, I can't. I'm, I'm not going to pin this all on the Biden administration by any means, but the world is on fire. And this is just the latest example of it. A strong America provides for a stable world, not completely. But we've seen this administration, as I mentioned yesterday, evacuate more embassies and pull out more Americans from different countries than in any other administration in history. A strong America is good for the world. All right, folks, thanks so much for joining us today. Until next time, I leave you with the encouraging words the Apostle Paul found in Ephesians 6, where he says, when you've done everything you can do, when you've prayed, when you've prepared, and when you have taken your stand, by all means, Keep standing. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.